Hello, welcome to episode of Smartland's Get to Know podcast series. Today we have a very special episode as Steve Guesses, co-founder and partner here at Smartland, is joining us. Steve, thank you for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Jack, awesome, yeah. Um, I was looking forward to it. I've been watching a few uh, episodes as long as this is an episode one. Just kidding. Man, so me too. To we've it. we've pulled some some good content out of Val and Jerome and Victor, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say today. Okay. Um, man, you've been here since the inception of Smartland. Walk me through what that time was in your life and, and how you got here today. Um, yeah, so as a co-founder at Smartland, we began... We began one house at a time, right? Um, a dozen years ago. Uh, what what was that like? A time of my life. Um, well, I had just gotten like another graduate degree done. Uh, we were transitioning. We had just sold um, a property management company that 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 Smartland really was birthed out of, right? Uh, and I was starting a young family. Um, just getting married. I think just having thinking about kids or thinking about marriage then and uh, looking at real estate as the opportunity that can help segue not only my future, but possibly, you know, the young family that I was thinking about and what that future could look like for them generationally. I think that 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 was really what that was like my aha moment for what the priorities were right and uh i was lucky enough to to be a part of real estate so just to be clear right i'm not a realtor i'm not a real estate broker um but we transact in a lot of real estate and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later but but my young self then uh you know we were we were off the heels of just where we had a few different arms that that were operating under Smartland, right? We had a we had a construction division, we had a management division, we had a leasing arm, a marketing arm, um and it was all new, like our onion was just beginning to develop. And we were looking at what those systems looked like to implement for that onion and from a personal perspective, you know, as an entrepreneur, what people really have to I think really capture is that your day never really is – it's structured. You know, you have to have structure in your day. You have to have a calendar that you follow. You have to have a goal in mind for the day and obviously an outlook, you know, a forward-looking goal, thinking about what you're going to achieve. But as an entrepreneur, you know, you, you don't really have, right, like this box that you operate within. Like uh, things, things arise every day. Uh, you have to be able to be – to juggle both life – uh, the balance of life and work without losing your mind, right? And so how do you do that? And as a young individual, you know, I, I was so fortunate. My partner, Vadim, co-founder, he had already been through a few trials and tribulations with new startups, and he's also an avid serial entrepreneur. And so I was fortunate enough to have somebody alongside me that could not only mentor me, but support, you know, we can mutually support those ideas and also have a sounding board when things do get a little chaotic, right? And you have the opportunity to sit down and, and really think tank through some issues. And so as a young entrepreneur and understanding that, you know, you have to operate nonstop. Uh, that means not a lot of sleep or that sometimes maybe you need to catch up and get a lot of sleep, Right. Um, but it's not just like sleepless nights. That's not what it's about. It's about being willing to take the risks, uh, being willing to be forward thinking, being willing to do things when people are telling you that you shouldn't do them, uh, doing things that, uh, you know, not only influence and leave a positive traction for your personal life, but can also somehow impact the community. And so when you can really tether and figure out how to bring all those things together. And, and you need people around you, right? You need amazing people around you. So again, looking back at a young self, um, you know, I wish I could say uh, there's never a regret, but I wish, I guess, you listen to some of those more wise voices 
long ago before you have to get to the point that you're wise yourself and say, aha, uh-huh, that's why, that's why and what, you know? Now I get it. Now yeah. I get it. Did you imagine yourself always being in this entrepreneurial role in your adulthood life? Or when were you, like when you were younger, did you think you had a different path destined for you? I thought that at some point I may have, might be a doctor or I thought that I might be something in the science, life sciences world. You know, my personal background, I went to The Ohio State University, um, biology background. And, uh, but the biology background doesn't mean that, again, you have to be something associated with life sciences. I really, I'm really grateful that I pursued that track um, simply because it gave you a lot of exposure across all the major, not only sciences, physics, chemistry, math. I mean, you have to go right to the upper tiers of all of those categories. And all those categories re- require and all, around all of them revolve a lot of critical thinking, but they all essentially are building blocks, right? So if you go through like chemistry or, uh, you know, organic chemistry, they all build upon themselves and business is exactly like that, right? So you have an onion that constantly growing and things are building upon themselves and you have different avenues and different departments and mechanisms that all have to work together and you have to sync up and that's like incredible, right? So some people write music and they produce music and some people are artists and they can produce amazing paintings. We're business people, right? We're entrepreneurs. We're serial entrepreneurs. We like, we like the forward outlook of risk and impact, community impact, and uh, how we can tether those two challenges and really make a true, true, you know, change um, somewhere. And so, yes. So did I imagine myself here? No. Am I, I can never imagine myself not here either now now that you're here correct so you said you went to school for biology right yep biology upon graduation did you go straight to smartland or what were the first type of couple jobs that you were looking for to enter the the workforce well upon graduation i thought i was going to an eight to five job upon graduation i also thought i was going to dental school at some point in my life um none of those things really as as i said happened But, but that's not true either so uh i left Just graduated uh, out of Ohio State, moved back to Cleveland, Ohio, uh, started a job at that time at the Cleveland Clinic uh, as uh, in their operations administrative role, very low level role. The idea was that uh, I was going to continue going to school, work on my master's in biology, and then pivot to dental school from that point. Um, Right. At at what point in the process did you realize that? Um. When so, as I was finishing up my my graduate degree in biology, I was I started my MBA, and so while I was working through that, and I was sitting at the clinic, um, went on a vacation with some buddies. They started telling me about some things they were doing with construction, and I had already known Vadim from a prior past, and uh, called him up and I said, Hey, listen, I know you're, you got this property management thing happening and, uh, not sure how much construction you're doing, but I have this nine to five job and, uh, I'm really trying to squeeze myself out of it. And I propose I can do X, Y, and Z and possibly deliver some X contracts. Uh, you know, how interested would you be? And he's like, no, we're not really doing that. I said, okay, well, let me, I'll work on it in the background. And if it comes to fruition, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. And, uh, you know, one foot after the next one contract, uh, you know, fill out and, uh, followed the steps and got the contracts and one contract, next contract, third contract. And I called over a and I said, Hey, look, like, you know, it's going to be hard for me to continue this path, um, sitting here at the clinic and also getting contracts, working these deals, whatever it is. Uh, and they're construction related. And so at that point, I decided I'm going to leave my job, finish my MBA and uh, go over and join Vadim. Um, and at that point, that's when that led into developing a whole construction arm, um, which we now use for uh, self-performing on our projects. Um, and when we purchase multifamily or single family or any type of light industrial product, so how how did your role develop from day one to day three sixty five? 
uh, when I first began at Smartland, yes. or uh, or from day one to today, three sixty five is today, um, right? The first um, day of Smartland. What what was the value that you were providing? Day one. First day at Smartland, we I brought in uh, new construction contracts that, uh, which was something that they had not been doing before. Uh, it was servicing uh, lead abatement. Uh, for lead removal, we were using federal grant dollars that were coming into the city, which gets back to community impact and mm-hmm. community, you know, doing well. And so we were able to tether these contracts into both uh, a two two pronged approach, right? So it's community impact, uh, and we were building out a construction arm in parallel, right? So it gave us it gave us exposure into construction that they didn't necessarily have before. Before they were just in property management, so they were doing, let's say, just light rehab or like tune-ups after unit turns or maybe some maintenance work. So this opened the door to what is now our entire construction uh, operation. How, you know, once you got boots on the ground and got that part of the business rolling, what was your next transition? Oh, boy. Um, so I've worn every hat. I've had the opportunity to be a part of every part of our business, um, for the most part, um, or at least sit in, 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 in every part of our business. So after construction, uh, I've walked over and I was in sales and working with investor relations. Um, at that time we had been purchasing a lot of single family residential, And the idea was actually, we had already been doing that in the prior business. So in 2015, we sold what was Cleveland Property Management. And in 2013, 14, we had already started developing um, the Smartland brand and the name and and all of those things. And the idea then was what we were doing was, one, it was in volume, but it was complicated. It was complex because uh, not only did it have a lot of actors involved, but it had a lot of components involved in the system. And what I mean by that is that because we were acting primarily as somebody's property management company, right? Even though we may have had assets of our own that we were managing within within that um, strategy, but we were always pickle in the middle, right? Mm-hmm. So like you're bad on the tenant side and you're bad on the owner side. And the part of the issue is that when you're just taking on property management, you're acquiring whatever's there, right? And then it's yours to kind of face the music with. Um, And we had seen that the biggest administrative challenge was not only in the time, but also the maintenance exposure and the monetary exposure that you get from having this mixed bag of of goods, right? All over the city. And so when people were saying, hey, it's so hard to manage um, a scattered site, let's say single family residential, you know, how do you get over this hump? Well, we were planning on an exit because what we saw was the that the opportunity was to focus in on acquisitions, renovate them in advance, place qualified residents, and then manage the assets for investors that wanted to buy a turnkey ready to go asset from us. So was that the original entrepreneurial venture slash strategy that really gave Smartland its first identity? Yeah, I would say definitely the the fact that we standardized that turnkey process that mm-hmm. we were just like a retail store that an investor could walk into and just pick a ready to go, you know, cash flowing single family home that's been modernized that's already has a tenant that's cash flowing and is managed by a company that has standardized the process to all the other assets that they're managing across the portfolio. It's a win-win across the board. It's a win for us. Right, because we're not now just getting a random asset that now we have to face the music with, right? Mm-hmm. On both sides of the equation, the owner be responsible to them for collections and for capital improvements and whatever else you know is is involved with single family uh, management. But now also, right? Like, so you're removing that component, and then now you have the standardized paint color, so for like unit turns and other other hurdles. And not only that, but now you're also bringing in qualified residents that that are moving into homes that have been already renovated. And so they're attracting a more qualified resident as well. And when you put all that together, you get the best outcome. So as we both know, a real estate private equity firm like us will only grow as much as the capital you can access. 
how is that approach to gaining investors, uh, gaining capital to to expand the business change from the turnkey property business to where we're at in multifamily today? Well, there's been a, you know, honestly, it hasn't changed that much necessarily. So a lot of our clients then that were coming to us were already going down that path. They're professionals that are busy with their lives. They want access to real estate. And so they may or may not have been a credit at the time because for, to buy turnkey, you didn't necessarily have to do that. Um, and so, you know, we work with a lot of folks on an individual basis. We have a lot of client referral, a lot of referral where, you know, go talk to Steve, the real estate guy, mm-hmm. um, or Vadim, the real estate guy, or um, they have they have guys at Smartland that do real estate. You should go talk to them. Um Part of that has to do with is that folks are always looking for one, you know, when it comes to finance, there's a lot of trust involved, right? So like uh, you have this component that you have to, you have to carry. And so the way that we do business today and our approach in, let's say client, client growth, uh, yes, a lot of it is word of mouth, social media, Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very one-on-one type of relationship. So no matter if we have several hundred clients or several thousand clients, um, we know all of our clients by their first names. We know our clients. Um, typically, we're, we understand what their strategy looks like. And uh, to get to that next uh, level of, I guess, cooperation amongst us and uh, who our clients are or investors that participate with us or alongside us and who partner with us, you know, this year you're going to see that Smartland is going to be offering a lot of uh, more smaller, like intimate events, uh, maybe throughout the Eastern Seaboard initially. Mm-hmm. And so we're working on that, right? So, so client acquisition is always super important to us. But our clients are typically, again, professionals, accredited investors. Um, how do we speak to them? We speak to them exactly like this. They're regular, you know men and women that are just busy with lives and simply want exposure to real estate. And what's really important is that some of our clients have been with us for a decade, uh, five years, eight years. Uh, Last year or a year and a half ago, I was on the phone with a client who told me that they were doing due diligence on us for eight years. That's incredible. Absolutely. Right? So they followed our story for eight years and that is so powerful, right? Like I didn't even imagine that that could, I just, I wasn't really thinking that somebody may be following our story that long and to hear that and to just like, also there are days that go, that, that I'll come in and I'm like, wow, like our team is incredible. Like we do this day in and day out with a smile on our face and we're ready to not only serve, but also receive new, new clients and look at new opportunities and look at new ways to do business. Like there is not one day. I tell this to all my friends too. And this is like that, that typical, you know, I know it's a very, very, um, how do you call it? Uh, I don't know the right word term. I'm I'm losing it. But, you know, this is not work. This is also not a hobby, but this is a passion. I mean, and I, and I think that if you were, as you get through more and more of the staff here and you speak with them, you'll see that they're, everybody's passionate about what we do here. And that is incredible. That's what drives me to come here every day, right? It's like the people, the community, and everything that we're about, and knowing that this is impacts generations, and, and that's incredible. Absolutely, for for our investors and and the people that work here. Of course. Now, as entrepreneurs, as we've said before, even in this podcast, that pivoting is always a very important aspect to keep your business growing. Um, you guys had a really great fruitful business going with the SFR segment in the early years of Smartland. What did it take and what were some of the fears going into that first multifamily purchase? I mean, you're putting, you guys have already had a great track record, but now you're just going to decide, Hey, we want to put our names and our money 
and our reputation on the line again. So what, I mean, was that a fearful venture for you? Was that no, it wasn't enter, fearful. It was, it was exciting. Okay. No, it was, yeah, full confidence. I mean, it was so exciting because it gave us, you know, we were already working through 100 plus um, acquisitions and flips and massive renos. Because what we were doing, we were buying the homes is that we were going through the whole house. Like this wasn't like just lipstick on a pig, right? This was the whole thing. So it was new floors. It was all new paint, new kitchens, new bathrooms. But we were doing them one by one. And yes, you're right. Track record, historically successful, all these things. But you just the system had now built up where it could intake more in order to keep feeding it because we were growing it, right? We needed to be able to land somewhere and have 12 units to work on right away um, or 40 units to work on or 100 units to work on. In parallel to what we were doing in the single family business, right? So like we never stopped. I think this is where we, we've talked about this back and forth all, all afternoon, but we never stopped the single family business. We do not sell turnkey assets, but we still acquire single family rental uh, for Smartland's portfolio, as well as um, for our funds portfolio and just to have a high velocity flip business. That business, it's a system in itself that's already in place. So when we're talking about, you know, that risk or that next step with multifamily, it was just to feed the system, right? It was just to increase the volume. I mean, we just had, we had now the capacity and so we needed to fill the capacity. And that's what drove us actually to try to get into multifamily. Plus we wanted to go to several thousand doors, right? And so the pathway through single family was going to be just much longer. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw that for us, at least it was going to be much longer. Like we're not um, invitation homes and we're not funded by wall street. Right. So we, we have to do what we can and scale at the capacity that we see that we have access to. And uh, what that meant for us at the time was adding the multifamily. Man, so none of this, you know, decade long or over a decade long business and story happens without just an insane amount of work ethic. <laughs> um, I'm under the firm belief personally that it's no one's born with it. It's conditioned in you. It's it's learned over time. Tell me about how you were conditioned and how you learned to, <laughs> to get to this point. Into, um, and how you knew what was necessary to to build something like this. Yeah, the conditioning, um, you're right. But, but no, some people are born with the spark, right? But it's uh, conditioning the spark. Maybe that's, that's what we... That's conditioning what, the spark. I yeah, like conditioning the spark, right? And so um, born in Odessa, Ukraine, right? Came to the United States with my parents and grandparents in tow. Uh, refugee status at the age of five, landed in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we were so grateful to our sponsors. They all retired from GM, um, which is incredible, right? Like what is more American than GM and me um, today, right? And so, um, but when we arrived here, you arrive with just who's with you and whatever you have with you. And at that time, yes, I was a baby, right? Like I was five and I could not understand and realize those things. But year, the next year and the next year and the third year, and you could begin to slowly shape up as you're getting older, the picture around you. One, the first picture is watching my parents go to work, go to college, juggle multiple jobs, uh, learning English or whatever it was in an effort to what I call today was to allow or provide a platform for myself or my sibling to be able to really capitalize on what America is really about, right? And what America is truly about, it's an opportunity. And so if you can figure out how to tether that opportunity and if it can be conditioned along the way, as you put it, 
that's some powerful stuff. And that's why we're here today, right? So one of it was the conditioning of watching my parents just grind and grind and the grandparents grind and go through a serial entrepreneurship process while maintaining eight to five jobs and my grandfather being a painter and figuring out how to be a painter and being an entrepreneur himself here, restarting his whole, his whole life at the age of 50, right? With no English and just a paintbrush in his hands and just putting away every single additional dollar, never buying, eating out, just watching all of those things and those habits. And the idea was to offer a platform for the next generation, right? So as you got older and you watched it and you could also reflect on it, I started working at the age of 12. It was not a very laborious job. It was uh, help, assistance, and some sort of sales, handing out flyers at, at expos on the weekends for a company, right? And so I did that. I set up small car washes with buddies of mine in the apartment buildings that, you know, that where we lived and we did that and we raised a few bucks and, and it was never that we didn't have something or something wasn't provided to us, but we understood how difficult it was to get to that point. And so it wasn't fair, right? Like looking back and reflecting on it, I just think I call it not fair to have to expose the people that are trying to get you to the next platform to have to want, want, want all the time. Right. Like we were given a lot, like we were provided for, like it's incredible. Um, but all that was on the basis of this was the place in America. You could have that opportunity to build for your family and for generations. And so when we began this conversation today, my fuel and this dedication and this level of obedience to the job or to the mission is because in America, when you provided the opportunity, if you truly believe in the American dream and that you could have it here, and we were given this opportunity through commercial real estate and being provided that opportunity of trust to acquire commercial real estate at the broker level, at the credit level, at the banker level, it is my duty as an American to also set that platform for future generations of my own Americans, right, of my children, to be able to live out that American dream, that opportunity, and to be able to make a difference in a community, right? So today, I was afforded the opportunity, the platform to do it with, not only to help others build generational wealth, build generational wealth for ourselves, build generational wealth for all the stakeholders, right? That's people here at Smartland, but that's also, we impact communities. We make things better here every day for people's lives. And that is what's really that I'm passionate about. It's nice what we do. I love what we do, but what I truly love about what we do is watching the change that we're impacting on people because I came from that background. And so if we can provide a new platform within our communities for people to raise up off of and to give them that level of new confidence, knowing that they live in a smart land property that's amenitized and modernized to today's standards, and they may be in a tertiary, secondary, um, suburban setting, that I think is powerful. And that is what that that that's the type of ethos that drives me is that that's impactful. That's something that we can leave behind. And and it's special. It's really special. Steve, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, uh, thank you. Personally, I learned a lot. I'm sure all our, our viewers at home did. And uh, we'll do this again soon. OK, look forward to it. Thank you for tuning in to Smart Lens Get to Know podcast series. Make sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on all things Smartland.